All right, everybody. Hello. I hope you have had a good Thanksgiving. Um, today we are talking about eye movements, and uh, eye movements have a very interesting uh, literature and history, and they are uh, intertwined. The literature is intertwined with the history of visual attention because uh, that's the uh, easiest mode of attention. How do you know where I am attending to? You look at my eyes, where I am looking. And uh, then there are other types of attention. But before that, there is the physics of eye movement and the physiology of eye movement, which is very interesting and quite important in many, many, many vision studies, actually, because there is no common understanding of eye movements. You see uh, errors and problems that come from like lack of proper control for eye movements. Sometimes you see simple eye movements, fixational eye movements can explain effects that are found and are attributed to other things. And uh, so it's quite important to be familiar with the eye, eye movement literature, at least uh, superficially. And uh, Reza has done, Reza Azadi here uh, has done uh, his PhD on eye movements and he knows more than me on the topic. So uh, today he will be leading the discussion and uh, we will all be contributing to the discussion. Uh, Reza, please go ahead and start. Okay, great. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about eye movement. I just, I mean, like always, I, a few hours ago, I finished uh, polishing my slides and I noticed that it's a little bit too many slides. Uh, I have more than 70 slides now. I don't think we can cover all of it. That's the reason that I decreased the contrast of visual attention here. I don't think we can cover that much of visual attention, but uh, let's go through them. And the goal here is not I cover all of my slides. The goal is you learn something. So please let me know. I mean, whenever uh, something was not clear, just to stop me to dig into it more. Okay, so let's go through it. Um, so as you know, we move our eyes when in normal life, whenever we want to look at a scene like this photo, uh, we move our eyes around it. For example, these are the fixations of um, just a typical subject on this picture. So you see this human uh, subject make saccades, I mean, fixate on this boat, on the mountain, on the lake, on the deck, different part of it. But the first question that I want to ask that is, uh, why do we need eye movement? What's the function and benefit of eye movement? It's a simple question, but I just want to uh, let you speak to break the ice first. So who wants to answer this question? So the question is, why do we need eye movement? I would say because... Ah, you go, go ahead. No, no, Sophie, Sophie, go ahead. I was going to say, I, partially because we want to sample different parts of the environment, and um, we want to do that with high acuity vision, so we, we move our high acuity vision scope around. Excellent. Yeah, that's, that, that's one function, which is very important. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say <clears throat> sort of the same thing, but the fact that we don't have a uniform retina, that we have high acuity in one region and not low acuity elsewhere means we have to move our eyes around if we want to, uh, I don't know, do something like read or see exactly. something. Exactly, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So the answer, as you say, is, I mean, first of all, we don't have a big visual angle. We don't have a large visual angle or uh, a visual field or visual field is about 180, 190, 200 degrees. If you had a Google camera like this, uh, that Google sample street view with it, with it uh, we didn't need that much of eye movement because we can parallelly cover all around ourselves. Uh, but as a primate, we have much uh, smaller visual field. So we need to move, move our retina around. And as you say, uh, the retina has different, there's de different density of uh, photoreceptors on, on the retina. This is the density of cones on the retina. So as you see on the fovea, we have much higher density of cones um, compared with the periphery. And this is the fovea, I mean, visual field, it's about two degrees. And this is the whole visual field, which is about 180, it's more than 180 degrees. And we have a kind of something like a flashlight and we just move around and with a higher resolution uh, uh, 
coin density that we have in the fovea, we just scan the environment around, around those states. But eye movement is not a simple procedure. It, it, I mean, once you start moving the camera, then a lot of problems happen, which we, we are going to talk about it later. But in terms of anatomy of eye movement, uh, we have six different muscles in the eye. So this is a classic image from Gray's Anatomy. As you see here, uh, this is the side, this is the lateral view from, uh, from uh, lateral view of the eye and orbital muscles, uh, ocular muscles. Um, so it's a view from the side. We have a uh, lateral rectus here, superior and inferior rectus here. We have medial rectus, uh, rectus on the medial side. We have two oblique muscles here, which is superior and inferior oblique. As you see this superior oblique muscle here, it attached to a pulley here, and then it, at oh, sorry. Then it um, attached to the eye, then it insert to the uh, sclera. Uh, the advantage is it can pull the eye up and also rotate the eye. We have cyclotorsion. I mean, we have up, down, left and right eye movement plus cyclotorsion eye movement. We can rotate our eyes uh, clockwise or counterclockwise to its another degree of freedom. There are different nerves that uh, goes through each muscle. Uh, that's the biggest, I mean, that's a very general scheme of them. Um, if we want to talk about the different type of eye movements, uh, the, there are different ways to uh, characterize or uh, to um, categorize eye movements. One way is that we have virgin eye movements and virgin eye movements. In virgin eye movements, the eyes uh, move uh, in different directions. So left and right eye, let me play this video. Oh. So as you see left and right eye, in this virgin eye movement uh, moves in opposite direction. And we learned it in the 3D, uh, um, 3D perception lecture. Um, we have a smooth pursuit, which the eyes uh, follow a moving target. So we need the visual stimulus to move and then reflexively the eye follows the target. Um, this is a video of testing our smooth, a smooth, a smooth, per, a smooth pursuit eye movement. Um, uh, I start playing the video and you try to follow these white noise movements. I mean, it depends on the size of your monitor and your distance, we would see different speeds, uh, but I hope you can see. So now it's easy to follow, right? So it's getting more and more difficult in higher speed. I don't know if, um, oh, okay. I don't know if uh, the, you know, the Zoom technology is enough to uh, pass the YouTube video on it. So when the speed of the object moving um, uh, in front of us increase more than around 30 degrees per second, then we cannot pursue. So uh, the uh, smooth pursuit has some limit. We cannot, increase the smooth pursuit uh, speed more than some extent. We have two other reflexive eye movements. It, this is opto- the same, the same thing that we lose uh, the flies, right? We can't, we can't track the flies with eyes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's one example. So it depends how far they are. Mm -hmm. um, we have- Oh, can I ask a question? Sorry, my mic's not great tonight. Um, okay. But I wanted to know what is the advantage of having eye movements move in synchrony. So especially, or especially with the smooth pursuit, like um, I know with like chameleons, obviously they can rotate their eyes like separately from one another. So what's the advantage of having um, the ability to have both eyes moving together across the screen or glancing in the same direction? That's a very good question. Anyone wants to answer? I think it goes back to our stereo lecture in order to have stereo computations, as long as you have overlapping visual field, which is you know a lot of our visual field, if you have your eyes <clears throat> moving together, mm -hmm. then um, you know, they can converge 
on the same point in space and you can make a stereo computation. So if your eyes weren't overlapping, if you didn't have overlapping visual field, there wouldn't be a necessity. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, in other words, it's easier to calculate, I mean, compute the visual information mm -hmm. this way. So if I have two cameras and both cameras look at the same object and you know both objects uh, are in the fovea, I mean, one object is on the fovea in both cameras, it's easier to be, deal with that, that information rather uh, than the situation that you have two cameras, each one has different angle and you have different overlaps in each time and then you have to find the corresponding point between them. Okay, thank you. Sure. The problem, the fundamental problem here, these cameras and these eye movements are very noisy. And I mean, we learn about the disparity on the retina. So if there is any disparity on the retina, the fundamental question for a visual system is if this disparity is from the real disparity in the world or the eyes are not synchronized and, and, and it should synchronize the eyes better. Uh, which is very interesting that how our ocular motor system deal with this question and solve it with this, much, with, with this amount of accuracy. This is another type of eye movement, which is optokinetic response. So if I move a grating in front of you, you cannot fixate. Uh, reflexively, you will start moving your eyes and you have a slow phase following the grating and a fast phase coming back to the center. Uh, in a train station, when a train come in, if you look at other people's eyes, you usually see these kind of misdiagnosis. They start, when they're looking at the train, they start having this optokinetic response and it's reflexive. There is no way that, it's, that you can stop it. Uh, in old days, it was one way that they find if someone claimed that that person is blind, blind uh, that was one of the tests that they did to make sure that that person is really blind or not. Um, we have another one, it's of uh, vest vestibulo-ocular reflex which uh, it doesn't show in this video very well. If you look at my face now, if I look at the camera and move my head like this, you would see my, my eyes can fixate on the camera. So this is another reflexive uh, eye movement when, when we move our head and we want to fixate on something. Uh, with the vestibular system, we can, uh, we can guide our eyes to make them constantly fixate. And this is the last type of eye movement, which uh, it's one of the most interesting ones, at least in the literature, which is sockets. These are those fast jerky eye movements that we made. Uh, we, we often made three sockets or more per second. Uh, and sockets are fast eye movement that we scan uh, the environment. Sockets are more, I mean, it's very difficult to define voluntary and reflexive in these kind of uh, movement, but sockets are more voluntary than other eye movements we cannot start a smooth pursuit on its own. We need a visual target that moves, but we can start a subtype even with our target. Um, Sakats are super fast compared with other my eye movements. Uh, they can, it can take, the duration can, can be even less than 10 milliseconds to a few 10 milliseconds. Uh, and the problem is the visual system doesn't have enough time during subtype to to interpret the visual information. So usually during the soccer, it's a very fast ballistic eye movement. We don't have visual perception. And usually in the, in, when we fixate on something for hundred milliseconds or something, we have some, uh, our visual system can gather data, collect data from the visual field. So for example, this is, uh, if this subject look at these faces and make these kind of eye movement soccer patterns in each, uh, fixation, the visual system can see the words. And between the fixation, between when, when the eyes are on fly during the saccade, at least the classic notion is uh, we cannot see. We have uh, suppression of visual system, which we'll talk about it later. Um, the term saccade, it apparently came from uh, uh, 19th century. Uh, Louis Javal, I guess that's the pronunciation, or Javal, uh, a French uh, scientist, he observed eye movements. I mean, at the time, they didn't have eye trackers, but he looked at the eyes of subjects and asked them to read some text. And once they start reading the text, he noticed that, I mean, the notion at the time was I smoothly scanned the text, the text. But for the first time, at least he documented that the eyes doesn't scan the text. The eyes have some jerky movements 
that jump from one part of the text to the other part, and they, he called them sakai, which in French uh, it's a Twitch or Jake, Jake movement, the meaning of sakai. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, how did he do that? How did he how did he track the eyes? So he didn't have eye tracking. He just looked at the eyes. Uh, so how how does he know? How does he determine where the purple circle should uh, be? This is not this is not from his paper. His paper is just text. Uh, uh -huh. This uh, is just a demonstration. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he couldn't do that. He just uh, reported that there is some GRQI movements, and he called them sakas. Mm -hmm. There are and some. And what other... does the word mean? The word sakade. Means it means um, jerky or twitch, twitch eye move, twitch movement twitch. in French. Twitch movement or mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so there were a couple other scientists that they made the first eye trackers between uh, Jobal and uh, um, and Yarvis, but Yarvis made a very fancy eye tracker which was super accurate at the time. Actually, it's even accurate compared with what we have now. And he could track eye movement and he did a lot of interesting studies and he published a book based on his studies. The way that he started tracking the eyes, he, he uh, attached a mirror to, this is eye, this is cornea, and these are scleras, and this is lens. Um, this is a mirror that he attached with a suction cup on the eye of subjects. He had different type of setup uh, and this mirror that started could reflect a beam of light that he made in his setup. And then he had a photographic system that that beam of light can be recorded and he started recording eye movements. These are the sta stationary eye movement patterns that he recorded in the sense that uh, he asked the subject to look at the space and then he recorded the eye movements. He noticed that the subject looked at the eyes and mouth and now knows more than. So, you know, in theory, if we have a comp if you want to make a machine, that machine should uh, start scanning the whole scene from top to bottom. You know, uh, that was the notion at the time that the eye movement should scan uh, every every visual scene. But he figured, actually, before him, some other people figured that. But he documented it very well that no, uh, we have some fixation areas depending on the visual stimulus that we present to the subject. And in terms of accuracy, this is the main sequence of circulative eye movement that he plotted here that I, I'm going to explain it later more. Uh, and it's, I mean, when I saw it in his book, it's super accurate. If I want to make a main, main sequence with eye link that we have, it would have the same kind of uh, standard deviation that he presented in, in his book. Uh, Reza, <clears throat> before before go uh, forward, in terms of the technique, in uh, how did he get it to work so there is a rubber suction cup that goes on the eye and uh, then there is a mirror attached to it and where is the light source is it on the suction cup in a small lamp or is it some it's light outside. that shines? It, yeah the, the light outside. shine and the, so it's a mirror here the light uh -huh. shine and the mirror and it reflect and then uh -huh. it can capture the and light then, and then there is a film basically a that film. records the uh, the the, the yes. trace yes uh, uh, right. He had two different types. So there's a field that record the trace, but he had also another one that it records the time time, time stamp of the satellites. So so is the film rolling? Is it a so rolling? He had two different is... setups. He have a few, he had a few different setups for different experiments. This main I... sequence it's the uh, it's from the uh, duration or peak velocity of satellites, and you uh -huh. you need to measure the timing too. I see. So he could actually measure the time as yeah. well. He, would, he had a rolling film. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was. It was brilliant. Um, another study. That, they were mainly psychologists. So another study that he did. He presented this picture to subjects and asked them different questions like how old they are, these people, how rich they are, what are they doing, and he noticed that based on each question, with the same visual stimulus. Uh, subject has different eye movement patterns. So uh, that was actually very interesting at the time that um, not only the visual stimulus can change eye, eye movement patterns, but the top-down uh, uh, mindset that we had also, it, it drives the eye movement. This is what I, uh, this is very interesting in his book, which I very, I, I like a lot. So this is the uh, classic illusion that we all know. 
So we perceive this line li linger that this line, he asks subject to make saccades between the, the beginning, the start and the end of these lines on the top and on the bottom. And he record the eye movement. These are the saccadic eye movement and he record. And his result, he showed that when we make saccade on this perceived longer line, we have longer saccade compared with this shorter perceived line. And he concludes that our perception or what we think about the word, it reflects on our eye movement too. It's not only, it's not just the bottom of visual information that we get from the screen. Any question here? Okay. So now um, let's talk about the physiology of the arm eye movement and neural circuit of the eye movement. Um, it's a quite comp, I mean, it's, there are multiple uh, cortical area and ganglions and nuclei that they, they have uh, different roles in um, saccadic eye movement or in general eye movement. But the most important one in the cortex is FEF and in the midbrain is superior colliculus. That they both have neurons that if you stick electrode on them and stimulate them, the animal, this is a monkey brain, make a saccade. Uh, so they have the main role in uh, 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 saccadic eye movement. And there are different models based on the cells that they have. So these are like burst neurons, lung lasting burst neurons, burst neurons, supercoliculus neurons, and different nuclei in the uh, midbrain and brain, brain stem that can drive the eye movement. Generally, I, or more specifically, saccades. Uh, about superior colliculus, superior colliculus is uh, it's two nuclei uh, on the midbrain. Um, oh, sorry, I just noticed. I flip this image um, and the text flip too. So now you have a chance to read right from, from right to left if you want. So this is superior colliculus here uh, in the human brain. And this is a larger uh, schematic of superior colliculus. These are superior colliculi and inferior colliculi. Inferior colliculi has uh, their neuron drive with uh, auditory signals. Superior curricula, their neurons uh, drive with visual signals, uh, physical or anatomically or histologically, they get. So, this is uh, optic nerves, optic chiasma, and optic tract. And some part, some axons from optic tract, as we know, goes to thalamus, a lateral nucleus, and make the visual pathway. Uh, but some axons from optic tract goes to superior curriculum. So superior colliculus get directly input from retina, like other part of the visual system. I mean, can I interrupt for a second? Sure. The, I just wanted to add one point about superior colliculus because it appears as this uh, sort of remote, uh, remote uh, sideway, side pathway, exit pathway of the visual system. Yes, retina is connected to it and it's in the brain stem fine, but vision happens in the cortex. However, however, uh, I just want to bring to your attention that in evolution, uh, superior colliculus is big deal for vision. Uh, it's the ancient architecture for, for vision for uh, in animals that you don't have the development of the forebrain as much as the primates does, uh, that's, called like in a snake, for example, superior colliculus is called the optic bulb. In, in birds also, it's called the optic bulb. It's where the vision happens. So, so that pathway is a lot more pronounced. In, even, even in rodents, it's even more in pronounced. Rodents, yeah. 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 Um, if we want to take a look at superior colliculus uh, closer, um, so this is a monkey brain. This is the superior colliculus, and this is a cross section, a um, sagittal, no, a coronal cross section of superior colliculus here. So superior colliculus has different layers. I just want to uh, let you know that it receives inputs from different parts of the brain. Uh, so from retina, visual cortex, and frontal um, and parietal cortex. And the output, I mean, this is left superior colliculus, this is right superior colliculus, and the inputs and outputs are mixed together. I mean, it's just for simplicity, inputs are on the left side and outputs on the right, right side. And the outputs mainly go to the midbrain, the outputs that we are familiar with, 
uh, to drive the eye movement. It's sort of uh, the notion is it's a kind of relay place for uh, so FES and uh, frontal eye field and um, other part of cortex decide for making saccades and they send the commands to supericuliculus and supericuliculus make the eye movement and uh, make some feedbacks towards the cortex again. Different layers has different, um, usually the superficial layers has cells that they have more visual response. So if you put a target on their uh, receptive fields, they, they start, they, you can activate them. And the intermediate and deeper one, they usually have more motor response. They are motor neurons or uh, mixed neuron. Uh, so when an animal make a saccade, uh, then they start their activity. Superior colliculus has a very, uh, so it's very small. It's a few millimeters in, uh, in this case, this is the monkey. So these are millimeters. Uh, so as you see, it's just a smaller structure with a, in a few millimeter by a few, few millimeter. This is left side superior curriculus. This is rostral and this is caudal. So this is more frontal, this is more posterior. Uh, and as you see, it has a very uh, dense and nice uh, uh, retinotopic map. Uh, these lines are the horizontal leash lines here are iso amplitude saccades. Uh, and these vertical lines are iso direction saccades. So uh, let me actually make an example. So if I put an electrode here and I activate this part of superior colliculus, I could make a saccade with 40 degrees, uh, with, with angle of 40 degrees and amplitude of 10 degrees. And if I move this activation- Sorry, Reza, what do you mean amplitude? So um, the magnitude of the saccade. So, it's, so one is, uh, uh, so, it's degree in visual angle, technically. So if I want to make a 10 degree saccade, if I want to make a horizontal, but horizontal saccade with an amplitude of 10 degrees. So if I put so it- Is the amplitude point, just how far you're looking? Is the amplitude exactly, just how, yeah, exactly. okay. So it's like 10 degrees all the way to the right is 60 degrees or whatever. Exactly. Okay. Perfect, yeah. Um, so if I want to make a saccade 10 degrees, but horizontally, I should stimulate here. Okay. Because it's 10 degrees amplitude and zero degrees uh, angle. If I make a polar uh, plot about it, it looks like this. So this blue area, if I stimulate this blue area, um, I would make a saccade with 40 degrees angle, which is this angle here, and 10 degrees amplitude, which is the length of this vector. So the angle of this vector is corresponding to this vertical line, the iso direction line, and the, the, um, the length of this vector is corresponding to the horizontal lines here, the, um, the iso amplitude lines. Okay, I still feel really dumb. So are you when you say angle, you mean like this angle in the vertical direction? So when I say angle, I mean the angle of saccade, so it can be, we, I mean, it's just arbitrary. We can say, okay, the horizontal right ward is zero. And once you go counterclockwise, the horizontal light wa right ward is zero. And when you go counterclockwise, you increase the angle. Right, so, so I, understand, yeah, the I, vertical understand I understand, I guess, along the horizontal. What's the second number for? So the second number is for the amplitude of the circuit, for the length of this vector. So how far you want to go with your circuit? So you can make it a small eye movement. Go change the angle. I'm, I just feel very dumb. Like so, where you go, it, there's an angle between where you started and where you end up. Yes, that's one angle. Uh huh. And then there's an amplitude or length in degree, uh, in in degree in visual angle, which is technically the size of the circle. Okay. Um, let Let me make another example, actually. So. If I, if I activate this area, if I stimulate this area, can someone tell me uh, what kind of saccad I make? It, it would be... Uh, so first tell me the angle. Uh, like the direction? Yes, the direction. Uh, okay, the direction is gonna be minus 20 degrees. Exactly. Yeah, and then the amplitude. 
would be uh, like 15 degrees. Exactly. Excellent. Excellent. So, and so my question is, is it like in the, when you do amplitude, is it still in degrees because our eyes are like circular? Or I mean, they're spherical. So like it's, if it's, you're moving in a direction, it's still an angle. Very, like if you move in the amplitude, yeah. Very, very good explanation. One exp explanation is that the other one is yeah. usually in vision science, measure things in big green visual angle because mm -hmm. if I have a specific size, if it depends on, if I have an object with a specific size, if I'm closer to that object, it would be larger on my retina. Mm -hmm. on that time. So we, we, we measure the angle of that object on the retina. So it's, okay. I mean, I guess your explanation was more clear. I don't want to waste time, but I want you to know that I still don't understand. But I also don't want to hold up the class if everyone else understands. So let's go through it one more time. Um, so the activity of this area makes this circle. So this is the amplitude of the circle, which is the length of this vector. The activity of this area makes this circle. And so this is 10 degrees in visual angle, and this is 15 degrees in visual angle. So the, the length of the socket is longer when I activate this area. And one, if I go more and more codal, I, I would make longer and longer socket in this case. So Rosa, imagine a, a saccade is a vector, right? A vector has two properties. One is the angle, one is the size, right? It's how okay, short so is it or how long is it, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. so, so basically, uh, the angle is determined by which line you are uh, on it on on left to right direction here on this plot. So if you are stimulating the cuticulus and you're going right, 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 what is happening is that your saccade direction is changing, is rotating around the clock. Mm -hmm. And if you go up or down, you have longer saccades or shorter saccades. Okay, I think I get it now. I think I was imagining the angle in the perpendicular plane, like in the wrong dimension. Ah, oh, right, right. No, this is actually the, the angle, angle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but sometimes- and now that you are on it, uh, Reza, Reza, can I ask a question to like, now that you're answering that, can you answer sure. my question sure. too? The, is there anything equivalent of cortical magnification here? Like, like, is it that some parts of the visual space are bigger and then they get, like, is it, is that it getting very smaller as you go to periphery? That was very interesting. As, as you see when you go, I never think about it this way, but as, as you go to the periphery, it's getting mm -hmm. smaller and smaller. I see. I mean, so the, your resolution the area is getting closer work. and closer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that was, that was it. Uh, the other thing is, I mean, as you see the, the symbol of degree or but this is the symbol of degree, right? This, this O, this is small O. So this is a little bit confusing in vision science. Sometimes it's better not to use it and use DVA, which is degree in visual angle. Some people prefer that. And when you have a real uh, geometric angle, you can use this symbol of degree. Um, good. Thank you. So the, the next question is, imagine I put two electrodes in the superior colliculus and I stimulate both sides. What do you think would happen? You get the vector in between. How? I mean, are they, the vectors add up together or average or yeah. the eyes goes, I mean, there's another one, we need to take all. So the guys, the eyes just make a circle towards the uh, uh, more stimulated area to an area with, with higher stimulation? I would think the average or like, yeah. Yeah, average makes sense. Uh, there is a still debate about it. Uh, I mean, minor debates, but the mind, the main mindset is it's the victor goes what, towards What's the, the difference between summation or averaging? So the difference between summation and average, the angle is the same. Mm -hmm. The Maybe. average of the, the average has half of the amplitude of the summation. Yeah. I see. <laughs> yeah. And you can do uh, mu simul injection and inhibit some parts and test it. But the whole notion is it's usually more summation. So usually sum uh, to saccadic vector, which is very interesting. It, all of these are consistent with the idea that it's a relay part of the brain. So we decide about eye movement some, in some higher area 
and then we send the signal there and we say that, okay, make a stock hunt. Um, Reza, I, I want to know, so let's say you had a summation that was at zero degrees. Um, how, do you, how do you look with the high amplitude at zero degrees direction? So what is zero degrees? Is that looking straight? Zero degrees amplitude or zero degrees? Uh, direction. direction. In this case, if you define it this way, it's a horizontal right wire stock hunt. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, I get it. So amplitude is how you get to zero, is how you get to looking straight. Amplitude of zero is how you get to zero. Okay. Yes, amplitude of zero is technically fixation. Yeah, yeah, okay. Hey, here is a, I have a, yes. I have a question too, if it's okay. Sure, happy um, birthday. <laughs> oh my God, it's for, <laughs> it's for Eli, not for me. <laughs> I should take that out. I will soon. Bye, apparently. Anyway, the question was the following. So you just said that you were that people look if you actually make like an average or like sort of a linear combination of these two vectors when you stimulate in two locations, correct? So it's mainly vector uh, weighted summation. Because the thing that I was wondering is if it depends on the amplitude, um, it depends on the location. Maybe it's not the same because evidently if you go ahead, if you add two things that have a very long amplitude, you, you go you go away out of what exactly the dynamic range exactly. of the muscles. But if you're in a location that is close, like small, it might actually kind of um, operate through a linear combination. So probably there's not a rule for the whole field. Have people look at that? Exactly, yeah. And, and that was the reason that I said there is a still a studies on it. Uh, yeah, if you push the system towards its boundary, it wouldn't be linear anymore. And it has different uh, behaviors like everywhere else in the brain. Yeah, that was a good example. Is, is there any idea about, because that's like a normalization in the end. Uh, and I, I would be interested to know if you know or if you heard about how this stuff is actually computed. You know, when you start, when you uh, go to, through the details, when you say a stimulation, what does the stimulation mean? You have current, you have frequency that, uh, of your stimulation, and then you want to do different models of linear models and nonlinear models. So there are different type of models that might fit uh, that the data can, can fit on the data. Uh, um, but the general classic term is we have vector summation. Is, and is this, does this only occur in the unnatural experimental setting where you would stimulate two regions or is-, is That's the, a good question. How could we stimulate there, naturally? Some well, because na naturally you might imagine that, you know, there are certain things that drive our eye movements um, like, uh, you know, if you flash two red spot, if, if you flash uh, a red spot that that grabs our attention, we make an eye movement without much, you know, that's it. But if you put two red spots, you have two competing signals potentially to the colliculus to say, look here, look there. Do you like, would you create those conditions? That's a great question. There are tons of psychophysical studies on it, uh, usually. They, we, we answer these mod, I mean, the models on top of these uh, kind of research is saliency map. Yeah. So you make the saliency map on the superior colliculus or oculomotor system, and then you want to, and usually on those models, surprisingly, uh, the winner take all uh, is the response. So you look at one of them, you never look at the average of them, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and if you do it during eye movement, you can change even the curvature of the saccade. It depends if you do it very, I mean, uh, during the eye movement in the very beginning part of eye movement or at the end of the eye movement. And I would be more than happy to talk about it because uh, for the rest of this talk, it made me very excited actually, but I think it's too much details for now. But yeah, there are tons of studies that with role of distractors, when you have a distractor, then you make a suck but what would happen? Uh, so uh, the ballistic uh, analysis of saccade, uh, if I plot the saccadic eye movement like this, uh, let me actually show you this because we, we talked about the saccades a lot. Let me actually go through this uh, slide first. That's a brilliant experiment that they had a monkey. This is a fixation point. I mean, forget about the rest of this. This is the fixation point. And the monkey task was making saccade from the fixation point to a target here. And as you see, these are the saccadic eye movements and the saccadic eye movement traces. And they had another condition trial 
that during the sarkat they had an air pop and they pop some airs on their uh, eye on, on the monkey's eye and the monkey usually had to blink because of that air. So during the sarkat they stimulate or they they make they they, they uh, make and blink during sarkat. And as you see, the eye position changed dramatically. So the, so the eyes were totally off and then horizontally right. But if you look at the um, errors that you have, the precision and errors that you have in both conditions, they are very similar. So it looks like our visual or oculomotor system, no matter what, when the go signal happens, when you want to make a socket from one point to the other point, it goes. Even if you blink in the middle and you change all the direction of the eye movement, it is still uh, land in a very accurate position. Um, if you want to talk about the ballistic of the saccade, so uh, if imagine that I make a vertical eye movement, and here I plot the vertical position of the eye in y-axis as, as the time, as a function of the time. Uh, and here, this solid line is the eye position. So the eye is, let's say, in zero degrees, and at some point when the sucker does start, the eyes goes up and it stays on, let's say 10 degrees of visual angle. Then I can plot the eye velocity. So this is the derivative of this uh, step function that uh, the eye velocity start increasing. It has a peak velocity and goes down again when the eye stop on the uh, land on the target. Then I can here calculate the amplitude of saccades, the magnitude, the length of the saccade, the length of that vector. I can calculate the peak velocity of the saccade, I can calculate the duration of the saccade, and the latency, which in other psychophysical means we usually call it uh, reaction time of the saccade. So when the go signal happens, whatever is the go signal, how long it takes until the eye starts moving. Um, this is another example. So this is the, they call it saccadic magnitude. So uh, um, this is the saccadic magnitude uh, as a function of the time. Uh, this is the velocity profile of the eye. So we have a peak velocity here, we have some duration. And if I plot the, saccad, um, the, the peak velocity as a function of saccad uh, amplitude or saccad magnitude here, uh, I would get a, a scatter plot like this. What does it mean? It means that uh, each point here represents one single saccad. If I want to make a 22 degrees saccade amplitude, if I want to make a saccade amplitude to 22 degrees in, in uh, uh, eccentricity, I have about 800 uh, uh, degrees per second peak velocity. If I want to make 10, deg 10 degrees saccade, I have, let's say 600 peak velocity. And if I want to make a very short saccade, two and a half degrees, which is 10 times smaller than this, I have around, um, I guess it is 300 uh, uh, degrees per second peak velocity. So the length of the saccade is, uh, so it looks like something embedded in the oculomotor system. We, we cannot increase or decrease our saccadic velocity. Once he wants to do it, initiate a saccade, the oculomotor system starts, and based on the amplitude or the length of the saccade, we have different speed and different duration and different peak velocity. And it doesn't change. It's con con constant for every individual and every subject. No matter what kind of saccade you want to make, any horizontal saccade from any target to any other target, make this pattern. The, I, the term main sequence is uh, from uh, astronomy. There's, um, there's a kind of, uh, when you deal with data from uh, galaxies and you plot the stars like that, they have a shape like this, so they they, uh, they inherit it from there. Speaking of main sequence, uh, this is one example. So that's the traditional idea that you cannot. So when you start a soccer, if I if I ask you to uh, get your, I mean, if I show you two targets, and actually take your hands up like this, and look at your thumbnails and make a soccer from left to right. And try to, I mean, not to move your hands, but make that sucker the slower. Do you think it is possible? This is not possible. We, we have to make the same speed of the sucker. We can break it down in different suckers, but we cannot go smoothly between the uh, thumbnails. Uh, 
And the idea is we always have the same speed for the same uh, direction and for the same amplitude of suckers. But Where's this a, is what- I have a quick question. Um, does it matter how intense that stim, like if there was a red dot that appeared, right? And there was a faint red dot versus a really bright red dot, would that change how fast? So the classic it idea is no, it doesn't change. Uh, there are, I mean, if you measure it accurately, it doesn't change that. Mm. But there are some papers that interestingly show that it changed. Uh, it's not written on the stone that, uh, so if, if I ask this subject to make a soccer to this space and then make a soccer to uh, just white noise, and there's no difference. I mean, the subject doesn't get any different reward for making soccer towards it. But just because this is phased, uh, I can plot the eye movement. Uh, so this is the step function of the soccer. This is the position as a function of time. Uh, so as you see, the phase has shorter latency. Right. When there is a phase at the target, you have shorter reaction time and you make soccer faster and you have higher peak velocity. So the latency does change, but the velocity doesn't. Latency does change, also the velocity change. That was oh, the classic it. old notion that the peak velocity doesn't change. Here, there is no difference for the subject. We don't. So there are some other experiments that you pay subject more based on the trial, and those shows that where you pay more reward to the monkey, and those shows that you have higher peak velocity. But here, the subject doesn't get any difference. I mean, there is no difference for the subject. Just if you put a face or white noise. This is more attractive for the subject and makes a faster soccer if you measure it very accurately. But still, but still, uh, it is mainly a, the the ballistic move. It's it's a small modulation on the speed. It is like if you put it on your uh, previous plot on the main sequence plot, that would be mean that now if you use a face for this saccade or noise, it would be a little lower or a little higher. But yes, so it changed the shape of that main. The slope of the main sequence. So if you a are little. a little, but it's surprising because mm -hmm. saccadic eye movement, the main sequence, the idea is from superior colliculus and downstream in the midbrain and bones right. and and I mean there is no information of face there. So how come it can induce? I mean how come just the visual stimulus can change the velocity of the saccade? Right. Or at least you but, think there is no information of face there. Right. Right. Yeah. But if we take the big picture, if we take the main sequence plot, uh, the uh, if, if you can you go back to that plot, the yeah, the bottom one. Right. So yes. the bigger the saccadic ma magnitude is, the bigger the peak velocity of the saccade is. Like yes. I want to go farther away. I shoot faster. Right. And I agree that some tasks might, might modulate that a little bit. But that's the general principle. Exactly. Farther, yeah. faster. Right. Yes. What about time of time to arrive? If you plot instead of velocity, if you plot time to arrive, is it flat? That's a good question. It's called duration of the circle. Uh -huh, uh -huh, so uh -huh. main sequence technically, I mean, you can plot uh, saccad amplitude, I mean, you can plot peak velocity versus saccad amplitude or duration versus saccad amplitude. It's more linear than this, but it's it has- more linear or more flat? More linear. More, more linear because yeah. the farther away you are, the faster you go, right? So yeah, then your arrival time, time you have, should be. So this saturate here. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So you need more and more time to get there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is actually, this is what the harvest plotted, um, which was fascinating to me. This is actually wow. what you exactly say. This is the wow. amplitude. Uh, so this is the latency. Sorry, duration uh, as a function of saccadic amplitude. He did that with his suction cup and wow. Yeah, I mean, and that's amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. with eye link, we can we can make a data like this. Um, okay. So we have um um, this is. This plot that I showed, actually, this is from a paper from Robinson in 1972. And I talked a little bit about the eye tracker systems, but how um, these are later than Yarvis. So um, the, the psychologist eye movement experiments or pioneers were uh, around 1960s at the end. And these are after them, these are almost 10 years after them. And the problem that they deal with, these are the studies on the mindfulness. 
they couldn't put those patching cops and the monkeys were not stable. They blink, they destroy everything. So they couldn't uh, measure, uh, uh, track the eyes like that. Uh, and they had to develop their, uh, their own setup to track monkeys' eyes. Do you have any idea that how do they do that? The, easier, the easiest way, the very, very early uh, studies that uh, they track the eye movement, they just look for the saccade initiation. They put electrodes in the muscle. So in the orbital muscles, they put electrodes and technically they record EMG, they record the muscle uh, movements. With that, you can, you can estimate when the saccade starts, you can estimate saccade duration. You can even know if it's leftward or rightward because different muscles have different tone, but you cannot make this beautiful map. You, you are not that accurate that make this. Uh, any of post packs, have you ever used coils for socket for tracking socket for tracking eye movements? Arash, have you ever used coils? Even I haven't used coils. Oh, okay. I, I, I have used setups that had coil setup on it, but abandoned and sort of falling apart. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, infrared tracking generation. Yeah, so that's the old fashion, which is a very, very accurate system. This is, so this is Robinson 1972. This is Robinson 1963, that he made this eye tracker at the time for primates. So he put a coil around the, um, the cornea and he sutured it. These are the sutures. So he stabilized the coil around the eye and then he put the wire and he take the wire out and he connected to a, uh, just analog system and he record the voltage from this coil. Obviously, when you move your eyes, there is no voltage in this coil, so you cannot record anything. But he put the monkey, I couldn't find any picture from the monkeys, but they put the monkeys in a magnetic field, in a specific magnetic field, that there is some physical property of that magne magnetic field. And when the eye moves, that coil moves and it drives current into that coil. So if you record the current from or voltage from the coil, you can calculate, estimate the eye position based on that current. You can calculate the eye um, the eye velocity based on that current. There is a still some labs using it. If, so usually for monkeys, uh, people don't use it anymore because it's slightly invasive. The advantage that it has is you can track the eyes even if the eyes are closed. So you are you don't have to see the eyes. You can track the eyes with coils. Uh, but nowadays some some labs use it for human. There are some um, uh, contact lenses that has coil in it. And if you want to do a very accurate eye experiment, this is one way that you can do that. Uh, those uh, uh, contact lenses are quite thick because they have a coil in them. So they are not very, uh, it's a, it hurts a little bit when you use them. So I used to use work in a lab uh, that they had coil system and all the postdocs and undergrads, they used that. They had to use it because they were subjects of their experiments. So they hate, they hate that system. They waited. Um, until the PI passed away and they took the coil system out and they broke it down because they hated it at the time. There are new technologies. How, do, uh, how is it not slide on your eyes? This is one they... problem with them, actually. Uh -huh. It's like other contact lenses. They're usually uh -huh. stable, but they can uh -huh. slide. Yeah. Um, Nowadays, there are other eye tracking systems. We usually use the video-based eye trackers. Uh, nowadays, like iLink, uh, most labs usually use that. Uh, it's very convenient. Um, so they just find the pupil uh, and they find the center of pupil. So when the eye moves around, they can, they can decode where the eye is. They usually have an infrared, infrared, infrared reflection on the cornea for the head movements, but in theory, by just tracking the pupil, you are able to uh, 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 track the eye movement. There is another system which is more complicated. It's 10 times more, I mean, not 10 times, it's more, more, way more accurate than uh, the video-based video, video -based system, uh, but they are more complicated and less adaptive. They call them dual Purkinje uh, eye trackers. So this is cornea, this is lens, if I uh, shine a beam of light or a laser pointer on the cornea, I get different reflections from the 
cornea and lens. And I get actually four reflections and they usually read the first and the fourth of reflections. And based on the distance between these reflections, you can estimate the position of the eye. These are super accurate. These are dual 14 G uh, eye telescopes. The other types that they do ophthalmoscopy and check the retina directly and the object on the retina, but these are the main uh, main eye trackers, eye trackers that no idea if you has been, I mean, are, are used. Um, things that I uh, say, I'm any, do you have any question? Anyone has any question? Yeah, I was wondering if you could explain more. Uh, well, the second figure A, what what exactly that looks like and how like what type of light is flashed onto the eyes? So imagine that I just put a, I mean, to simplify it, imagine that I shine a laser here. If I shine a beam of laser here, I would get a reflection from the cornea and I would get a reflection from the back of the cornea. Whenever you have a, a discontinuity of material, you would get a reflection of the light. So um, well, what's the example for you? Imagine you're standing in front of a shop with multiple windows, like layers of windows, and you see multiple reflections of yourself in the glass. Uh, there is one reflection on the front window. There is actually, if you pay attention, there is one from the back of, if you have a thick glass, you see the two reflections, one from the front of the glass, one from the back of the glass, and then another one, another one. This is like that. There is the cornea, there is the lens, each one of them is sending a reflection and they're a little offset because of the physical distance between them. Exactly, yeah. What's the limit, what's the major limitation of, of that second type of eye tracking? Um, so you need a very good accurate system to first of all make that, uh, that beam of light with a very good accuracy. You should know where you are shining the light. Uh, and then reading, finding these two, uh, I mean, uh, finding these two points and calculating the distance between them, it's more complicated than these. At least this is the system that we have. The, Purkin, the dual Purkin G image, there is not much, uh, not many set up. Uh, usually they make them in the labs. Uh, there's just one that I know, but the video based, they are, they make them in factory. You can buy them wherever you are. Some of them are super cheap for a hundred dollar or a couple hundred dollar. You can buy one, one video tracker. But these are very, very expensive and they need a very high demand maintenance. Uh, Reza, I just want to remind you that you've got about oh. 20 to 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, the, depending on how do, do we want to deal with the questions. But if you want to manage your content, like there are things that you want to make sure you are communicating, it's okay. time to think about um, that. I, I think I just go through my slides. Um, Let's see how far mm -hmm. I can go. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to cut them down, but I didn't find any point yet. So, uh, so we have also some kind of, so the thing that I just talked about, those are just eye movements uh, that we want to voluntarily make those eye movements, but we have also some fixational eye movements. Even if you want to fixate, even if you try, this is a, a trajectory of eye movements, for this object when it's fixating. Even if you try your best, your eyes are still wiggling a little bit, moves around. And some of these eye movements, so this is the retina, for example, in this schematic, and this is uh, the fixation point trace on the retina, because when the eye moves, when the retina moves, the fixation point uh, moves on the retina. And it looks like, or our collimator system, I mean, this is that illusion that you saw uh, last weekend, even if you try to fixate your eyes, most of the time you still see the movement here because it's extremely difficult to fixate without any movement. And it's not possible actually for a visual system. And it looks like there are some systematic eye movements, even when we, we fixate. Some of them, they have different types, different names. Some of them are microsaccas, they call them microsaccas. They have the same properties of, of saccas. They usually have the same uh, neural circuit even and they are binocular. So it means that they are very systematic uh, when you have a binocular eye movement in the same direction. And there are models that shows that, I just wanted to mention it, there are models that shows that these eye movements, if you, if you remove these eye movements, 
So the idea is if I can remove this eye movement, I would have a better vision, but it's wrong. If I remove this eye movement, if I have an adaptive system and present the light on the retina exactly on the same location, the, the image become more and more blurry. Somehow or V1 cortex even, there are models that show that use these kind of eye movements to sharpen the tuning curves of the uh, uh, receptive fields or, or neurons. Um, no, I'm gonna talk about psychophysics a little bit more. This is a phenomenon, it's called soccer adaptation. Uh, so imagine that you have a fixation point and you ask the subject to make a soccer term fixation point to your target. And once the target is start the staccat, because you have an eye track here, you notice that and you move your target backward. So the subject lands with an error. So the subject eyes lands here, which is supposed to be target, but it's not there anymore. And it has to make a corrective soccer. If you keep repeating doing that more and more, after some point, you will see the socket land on the target. So the socket predict that you want to move the, the ocular motor system that every time I land here, it looks like the, side, the, the target is closer. So I'm gonna undershoot my socket. Was it clear? Yes. It wasn't, apparently. I'm just understanding what, what the motivation is behind. So that. the motivation is if I make a systematic error on socket landing, how our ocular motor system deal with it? Does it deny it? Can, is, is it flexible enough to absorb that uh, systematic error? It looks like it, looks like it is. Uh, it looks like if it's a systematic error, the ocular motor system adapts itself with a new position, with a new situation. When you say a systematic error, is the target that's being presented being physically moved? Yes. So at the beginning of this trial, you see where it is, you begin your movement, and before you get there, the target is moved. And exactly. when you get there, it's not your visual system recognizes it, it's made an error. And if you do this over and over again, eventually, when you initiate your eye movement, you will go to where the target will end up rather than where it started. Exactly. Exactly. Think about it. It's it's a it's a ballistic move, right? You are throwing your eye there. And imagine you are throwing darts at a target, and every time you throw, you are like low, uh, you, you're low, below the bullseye. And what you do is that you just adjust yourself and shoot a little higher, right? The ballistic saccade is like that. You shoot and then you check, did you make it? And now this experiment is testing how flexible that learning system is by, by tricking the system. Because if you remember, we talked with, during the saccade, we are kind of blind. We can't see much. It's like you cannot see your own uh, saccades in the mirror. Right, so they are tricking the subject by that. You see the target, you shoot. As the eye is traveling, they swap the subject position, the target position. So when the eye lands, it's like, oh, I'm off. And then you realize that it is changing its gain little by little to actually make it to the target. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as Arash said, after this experiment, if you ask the subject, did you see any difference? Did you see something happening? The subject says no. Even if you tell the subject that I'm in some trials, I'm going to move the, uh, the target. If the target step is short enough, the subject cannot notice it. During, if you shift anything during the saga, because we are almost blind during the saga, as I'd say. Um, when the eye movement land, usually the visual system blame on the eye movement and say, oh, okay, the board should be stationary because it's how it is. And this is the problem with eye movement. Actually, the first report of ad soccer adaptation was from patients with strokes. Some patients with strokes, they have weaker uh, nerves or nuclei to make the, the one direction of eye movement on eye muscle. And uh, neurologists noticed that uh, they adapt with the situation very quickly, way before the time that those nerves heal and come back to the normal uh, situation. And this is the way we double as the paradigm, we make it in psychopathic experiments in the lab. Uh, this is a plot of the uh, circuit adaptation that I said. So this is the trial number, and this is the gain or the amplitude of the circuit that I said. So this is the baseline without changing the uh, target position at, at first. 
uh, just normal saccade. And the gain is the percent of, so the gain is actually the saccade amplitude uh, um, divided by the eccentricity of the target. So if it's one, it means that you had a blue eye. You, you, you exactly land on the target. And in general, we don't have gain of wine. Or it's another story that why we don't have a gain of wine, usually over undershoot or saccades for some reason, especially if we have noisier eye, tra eye, eye oculomotor system, we undershoot it more and more. Uh, so the gain is around 95.95 here. And once the double is the one, this, once this paradigm starts, look how quickly after a few trials, the gain is start reducing. And after a hundred trials, you have a very consistent gain uh, of the uh, saccadic amplitude. And then if you stop that again, the saccadic amplitude goes back uh, high again. Um, so this is saccad adaptation. Imagine that you are in your cortex, you are the visual system. You try to make a saccade to this target, but you land here and the target is behind. So you, you feel that there was an overshoot saccade here. How could you make sure this is from oculomotor system as we explained, or maybe the visual perception was impaired. Maybe the target was closer to you and you didn't see, you, you, maybe the target was closer to you and you, your visual system made this error and see it farther from. So how could, how could you solve this problem? Was it clear the question? So any uh, any any saccadic error can have two different two different reasons. One is the oculum, the the the, the muscle, the move, the motor reason. The other one is the perception reason from the beginning when you have. Well, I was just thinking um, that potentially, I mean, if we looked at the the rates, the speeds again, um, I was just thinking that maybe you kind of like, just like automatically reduce the speed like your ocular motor system will automatically kind of like make you like if you're constantly overshooting it and like you you realize it then eventually and we said that like with more amplitude means you moved your eyes faster so like if you're naturally just kind of slowly just decreases speed then you would like stop at the right position yeah so, so that's the way that you explain how we calibrate this system yeah but the source of the error is it from motor system or is it from visual? Oh. How so, could we so, it could so that? If you were to if you were to do your psychotic adaptation and the problem persisted, then you would say I'm misperceiving this, right? It could be misperceiving, it could be weaker muscle. Uh, but if you but if you tried to recalibrate the motor system and that didn't solve the problem, like if the target kept moving in. That would tell you that it's not motor. It's a so, so right? the answer is when you start. So what whatever is the reason, whatever is the source, once you start making sure they're suckers, you solve that problem of the sucker. Yeah. But you still don't know if so. If I give you a lens, if I give you a pre uh, a new lens and you put it on your eyes, I can pre present the word closer to each other. I can shrink the whole world to you and you have overshoot saccades like that. These overshoot saccades are not from the eye movement. The eye movement are still calibrated. It's from the visual perception that we have from, the new visual perception that we have from the world. And, you know, in theory, there is no way. In theory, if I have a camera and I point that camera in different location and I don't have any any information about the angle of that camera, which we usually don't have with that accuracy, the angle of our eyes, uh, there is no way that I can, I can, if I move it smoothly, I can calculate everything and I can, I can say, okay, I moved it 10 degrees smoothly and everything moves like that, then I have the ground truth. But the problem is during saccade, we are blind, so I cannot calculate anything. So there is no, technically, there is no answer to that question. I don't know. I mean, the visual system, the oculomotor system doesn't know if the source of is, this error is from the motor system or the perceptual system. So we usually measure the motor system like that. Uh, so we usually measure the saccade amplitude and we report that after this paradigm. There's uh, some papers that start measuring the perceptual effects of it. 
So I do this backward or inward socket adaptation. So I make the socket shorter and shorter. And then after let's say 100, 200 trials, after here, 200 trials, I ask, so here, first, before at the at, at first, I just, I ask the subject to uh, fixate here, and uh, I, I I have a flash of a beam of light here. I, I have a target that flash here, and I ask the subject with a mouse cursor to localize this flash. At first, um, the subject can localize this flash without any error, but but. Once I start this stuck is inward or backward socket adaptation, I also adapt the personal perception of the subject. The subject feels this beam of light, this flash uh, bar is closer to it after that. Um, this is another interesting experiment that uh, if I want to simplify and generalize it. So if you ask the subject to make a socket to this triangle, uh, from this fixation point, if this is a normal uh, socket to a normal so object, and if I change this triangle, so if it's more circular, I make it more triangular, and the subject makes it again and again and again. So if I see something more circular, but if I obviate it, when I land here, I see it, it's more triangular. After 200 trials, I would see it, it would change the perception, the object perception of my system too. Um, this is from 2015. I found um, Jim DiCarlo did this experiment 10 years, almost 10 years earlier, but this, this was easier to explain. Um, as we said, we had saccadic suppression. So as I said, when you look at a mirror and make a saccad from your left eye to right eye, you cannot see your eyes moving because uh, the visual system is suppressed during the saka, and this is one of the first evidences that they find with electrophysiology. So they add, they put electrode in V1, and they ask subject to move. They train the monkey to uh, make a saka from this fixation point to, to this target, and they see they saw uh, right uh, during the saka and before starting the saka, the uh, uh, the V1 neurons stop, stop firing. So we have a huge massive suppression uh, somehow uh, on the V1 cortex. Um, I only have 13 more minutes. So let me, let me, let me go through two, three more slides and I know you will stop there. Um, this is another thing that's happening. So we have, uh, uh, we have saccadic su suppression, but th this is another thing that happened during saccad. If I have a fixation point and there is a receptive field here, if I want to make a saccad from this fixation point to this target point, so the, the receptive field is here. After I land here, the receptive field is here. Is that right? So the receptive field is retinotropic. It's the wiring of the retina. So the receptive field moves with the eye. But if I record accurately, and just right before the saccade, I try to find the receptive field of this neuron before, before the saccade, I would see that this receptive field jump even before the saccade. It means this specific neuron in fixation uh, responds to a target here, but just right before the saccade, it moves this receptive field towards the saccadic target. Is it clear? So the idea is that there's an anticipation, like the system knows where your saccade is going to be, and it moves the receptive field yes, before exactly. your eye arrives. Exactly. It moves the receptive field before your eyes arrive. Okay. okay. But then, the, but even though the receptive field is moved, it's not like, it won't be like rendered, right? It'll still be blurry, technically, because you don't, your cones aren't, not right on it now. Like the eye doesn't uh, move. The eye doesn't move yet. The eye doesn't start yet. Right. So the right, receptive field jump. Yeah. Yes. So, but your experience, oh, I guess, yeah. So this is when you're temporarily like blind. So you're temporarily so right blind you after move. it. It's, it's all before saccad. So there is no saccad yet. So saccad didn't happen yet, but the mm -hmm. receptive field starts moving, which is very weird. I mean, in two different levels. One level, yeah. how does receptive field move? Receptive fields are the connection of the 
uh, ganglions or photoreceptor to cortical neurons? Who can they move? Right. We cannot change this connection in a fraction of second all the time. And the second thing is, what's the function of it? Why it's, it just makes it more and more noisy. It makes more uh, mess if you want to analyze this data. So the internal representation is as though you've already moved. So you, the neuron- no, you haven't fire, moved. Like you're, you haven't moved your eye, but the neuron whose receptive field that is, knows that something is about to be in its receptive field and it begins to fire? Yes. As if the thing is in its receptive field, even though it's not physically there yet. Uh, so it's physically in the receptive field, but the receptive field is somewhere else. If I want to, so this is another presentation of it. This is first fixation point and second fixation point. These are receptive field A, B, C, and the same A, B, C. So when the eye moves, these, re these receptive field moves with the eye. So this is simple. But here, it shows that when you plan your sarcoid, even before you start moving your eyes, these receptive field jump towards the sarcoid direction. In this case. So how can this happen in theory? Did, did everybody follow the phenomenology of what happens? Right? So, so your neuron starts to respond to the future receptive field just before you make the saccade. Or at least that's the that's the yeah. common main mainstream understanding. Yeah. Yeah. This, this and, image makes me think that, so it's not just the receptive field of the fixation point to the target. It's all like all the receptive fields are moving. All the receptive out. fields shift that way, yeah. Okay. And it can be in V3, it can be on in V4, it can be in FEF, it can be in superior colliculus if I'm not wrong. So most of the high level visual system, it's not in V1, they couldn't find it in V1, but most of the high level visual system an oculomotor system, right before, we are making three saccades per second on average. Right before each saccade, this is whole mess that all the receptive will start shifting. And if I want to make it more complicated, they are not shifting towards the saccade. They are shifting towards the saccadic target. If I want to simplify it, they all shift towards the saccadic target, which is making it even more puzzling. First of all, how do they shift second why? I'm confused about the shifting towards the psychotic target. So if I have, if I fixate here, mm -hmm. and I have a receptive field that responds here. Mm -hmm. So if I present the target here, the receptive, the neuron, when I fixate in here, this neuron is receptive field is here. Right before the saccade, this receptive field jump here. But that seems to me different than the previous image that you showed of all. Yes, exactly. Oh. Yeah, that's even more complicated than what. Yeah, that was the mainstream. A little bit after, okay. this is the mainstream now. Uh, right now, I have a question too. Is this the same thing? This this changing the receptive field before you do the saccade. Is it the same thing happen to? Um, there there is a there is a the famous guy who like uh, make his eyes like like um, how how did he did it he just make his whole his whole body just like without any movement and when he just do the uh, the saccadic things he thought that the whole world will just move is the same thing that happened in that that uh, experiment uh, okay that's actually one is like i i if i have enough time i i i get to that too yeah that's correlated so I, I mean, so let me rephrase what Ilya just said. One of the functions that exactly the, that people, I mean, scientists think that it, it's, it's one of the functions is we have a stable visual perception while we do eye movement. And one of the ways that our visual system can make that stability is by moving the receptive field before eyes start moving. How can it make the, uh, this is the, Theory, this is the hypothesis. But how can it make it more stable? I don't know, but you see it on papers more and more often that these are moving because we want to stabilize the perception of uh, visual scene that we have around our soul. Reza, do you want to show the, uh, if you have a slide for Steven's yes, experiment, maybe, maybe that's the but best. But let's finish uh, it with that actually. Landing strategy. Oh, so, 
so, so let me just in one minute say this, um, all of these things that I said that happened before the Sakat, it means that our visual, our visual system has an, some information from the Sakat, from the eye movement. So uh, the idea is there should be some information in visual system before Sakat because we move these receptive fields because we have Sakat suppression. And in theory, they call it inference copy or corollary discharge. So whenever a command goes to uh, eye movement muscles from supericuliculus, another efference copy, another copy of that command sends to, uh, sends to thalamus, uh, the medial dorsal part of I mean, nucleus in thalamus, and sends to FEF and other part of the visual system. There are other pathways for it too. Uh, Descartes was the very first person that explained that we should have an efference copy in our mind. So if you close one of your eyes, and with your pinky finger, gently move the other eye, you see the whole world changing, I mean, moving. So it's a very, very subtle movement and you see that the world is moving, but every second you are doing three of these movements, 10 times bigger than that, but nothing moves. So it means that your visual system has information about the eye movement and can recalibrate all the, eye, all the object position in your mind. This is the experiment. Um, so this guy, he said, okay, if there is an inference copy, uh, before I move our, uh, my eye, so there is some, uh, some information in, in my visual system and I can, and my visual system, can, can, my visual system adapt itself before the, before the eye movement happens. So this is the I'm, most dangerous experiment in the history of neuroscience, by the way. Interesting, but I, I have something for you, Arash, too. Uh, so, so this guy anesthetized, I mean, with curar, with some, med, with some drugs, uh, paralyzed himself. So he paralyzed himself, so he cannot do any movement, including eye movements. The problem is including breathing, you cannot breathe anymore. So you have to be connected to a ventilator and, and a whole surgical system that uh, if you have any problem, they can see you. So he paralyzed himself deep down that he cannot move his eyes anymore. And then during this paralyze, he, start, he tried to move his eyes. So what do you think would, would happen in this sense? So his visual system thinks he's about to move his eyes. He's planning exactly. an eye movement. So the receptive fields remap, but then he doesn't actually move his eyes. Yeah. So I don't know what forget about the receptive field for a moment. You think that if I make a right eye movement, my everything in the world goes towards left on my retina because my move my, my eyes move moves towards right. So everything on the board goes towards left on my retina. So my visual system adapts itself to this situation by moving them back to the right side. So if I want to move my eyes to the right and my and nothing happened, but the efference copy do its job and or with my visual system shift everything to the left, I would see a leftward eye move, leftward move motion in my visual field. So whatever I want to do, if I want to do a right movement, I would see an opposite movement. If I want to do up, up, upward movement, I would see a downward opposite movement. In my uh, same direction, same direction, I suppose. Like if you um, want to do up, you should it should shift up. No, it should shift down because when you move your eyes up. So when you move your eyes yeah, up, it should move up. Move yeah. down, imagine so that you have, have it up exactly. again. Yeah, yeah, I was wrong. Yeah, yeah. So imagine that you have a target and moves with your eyes. It means that that target moves up with your eyes. So the whole visual field moves up with your eyes when you are paralyzed, because nothing moves on your retina. Yeah, Arash was right. You, yeah, yeah, because when you move when you move upwards, the world move downwards on your retina, and to cancel that, you need to move the more world upward. Yes, exactly. And oh, so because nothing's actually moving down on your retina, you just get like a net upward. Exactly, like the whole world is shifting. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. well, that, that's really. Cool. That's what and he reports. That was he, and if you no one else, no one else has seen it. If you think it's the craziest uh, 
experiment for the previous century, I'm going to introduce this one to you. Yeah. That in, um, what is the date? 2011, some other scientists did the same experiment with technically different medication, so it was less uh, dangerous. And I have some videos about it, but the videos was, the image was a patient that is just connected to respirator, so it doesn't make any sense. But they report four of six subjects report the same thing. Huh, I didn't know about this one. Yeah, that was that was very interesting to me. That okay, I think um, I passed. Yeah, it's uh, it's already thirty minutes late. So sorry, thirty seconds late. So I, I think I'm gonna finish my talk now. Um, thank you. Reza, thank you. Uh, that was very edu very educational for myself, uh, at least. I learned a lot. The, uh, the, there's one thing I wanted to add before we close the discussion. Uh, since, since you started with the idea of what are saccades good for, and uh, uh, based, uh, attributed that to the density, high density of uh, receptors in the fovea. Uh, that's that's that has been the idea around that you have only good uh, fovea, good good retina at the fovea high resolution retina at the fovea so you need to cover the whole world by moving that that's pretty intuitive. However, there is a little glitch uh, that like there is a crack in everything. Uh, the mouse does not have a fovea, but they do have saccades, and uh, so so it's sort it's a question that. If you, if you have a flat retina, why do you need saccades? What does it, how does it help you to have saccades? And uh, I just wanted to bring this uh, to the table that the whole story, the story is not that simple. There, there are other functions to saccade. For the case of the mouse, the idea is that actually, uh, even for the primates, that's another function of saccades, particularly short range saccades, because the mouse mice has uh, shorter range saccades, I believe, is that if you look at the natural image, the natural image is correlated, right? Remember the first session, the first session we had, the image has continuities in it, right? So, so if I am fixating at the center of this scene, very soon after a couple of seconds, my retina will be adapted to this image, right? If I move my eyes a little bit, that's not going to help it because on average next door next door points have the same luminance there is actually a number that you calculate you can calculate that how much do you need to move your eyes to fall into a new statistics of image like if a point is bright turns dark on average if a point is dark turns bright so that your adaptation is constantly refreshed and you get a number around those saccades that the mice has uh, so, so, so my point is that another function of saccades is to get rid of adaptation. Uh, snake does not have that. Reptilians do not have that. That's why uh, if you remain like motionless, they can't see you uh, because, because they get adapted to that and they don't have the saccades of their own eye movements. Uh, that's, that's another function of saccades to, to avoid adaptation as simple as that. Can I share no. a nice visual illusion that demonstrates that? Can I do, do a share screen real quick? I need it. I need to be enabled, and Res has to stop sharing. Uh, can I? Let's see. Okay. Should I enable you? Yeah, to, if possible. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. Okay. Do you guys see this? This image right here? I you still see Reza's screen. Oh, really? But I see his desktop. We have to go to oh. Okay. Okay, I'm going to try oh. again. Can you see this colorful go. image? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. stare at the black dot in the center, fixate, and try to not make any eye movements. Mm. Flattened. Yeah. Gone. Gone. So cool. And that image is a static image, but yeah, that's- As soon as I move my eyes, it appears, it reemerges. Yeah, 
That's, that's, that's a beautiful that's demo. That's what Arash was just describing. That uh, that's a beautiful demo. Yeah, it's totally adapt and see nothing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm, but the function mm -hmm. of uh, fixational eye movements, it's beyond that. It's also changed the exactly. cleaning curve of the B1 neurons significantly. It sharpened them somehow. Very exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a complex system adapted to this property of the system. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Reza. That was sure. very informative.